morning, everybody. Good afternoon or good night, whatever you are. That's the beauty of this kind of things. Uh, Giacomo Pisano here from uh, Dorin. I will talk to you about CO2 industrial applications. Let me know, uh, do you see my screen and can you hear me okay? Very good. So uh, today I will talk to you about CO2 transcritical technology in industrial refrigeration system. Again, my apologies if I have been late in, uh, in joining the webinar. Some uh, uh, software problem made me late. Sorry about that. A uh, few words about the company which I work for. Dorin is a 100% family owned business. Headquarters is in Florence, Italy. You are most welcome to come and visit us. Uh, we have operations in other countries. We have production in China. Uh, we have a large warehouse and uh, sales facilities in the uh, US as well. And then we have sales offices in Brazil and Russia. Uh, we are about 200 people, uh, 75,000 plus compressors manufactured in 2021. In total group revenue, uh, 62 million euro in uh, 2021. Uh, a little bit on uh, our CO2 journey. In, uh, in CO2, basically, we started first developing CO2 transcritical compressors. Um, we have been delivering the very first piece of equipment in 1995 to Gustav Lorentzen uh, team uh, in Norway, uh, where they were validating the use of CO2 with floating head pressure. They have basically been reinventing uh, modern CO2 refrigeration. And then after this uh, very old uh, piece of equipment, we have been placing into the market more and more compressors uh, from uh, various platforms. And in 2020, we launched into the market uh, our flagship compressor, the largest transcritical compressor actually available in the market. Um, Let's go a little bit more into uh, the topic of today. It's a kind of comparison between CO2 and ammonia and industrial refrigeration system. Um, clearly, uh, ammonia is a great refrigerant from a thermodynamic standpoint. Uh, it has some drawbacks, uh, like every refrigerant, clearly. Uh, some of the drawbacks of ammonia are concerning safety uh, due to toxicity and flammability of the refrigerant. Uh, so normally this brings to uh, some sort of uh, uh, interest in alternative refrigerant than ammonia for large industrial application. Uh, this is true worldwide, for instance, in the United States, there are uh, several um, laws and several guidelines that have to be followed from OSHA, from EPA and from DHS that are kind of uh, imposing some specific regulations and safety requirements for uh, ammonia system. Uh, basically with CO2, it can be dealt much easier. Uh, let's say clearly with CO2, you still need to have a lot of attention to the use of that refrigerant because uh, it's not, um, it, it, is, it can be troublesome to a certain extent. Uh, but clearly, the, there are some differences with, uh, with ammonia. Um, let's say, uh, from an ammonia standpoint, uh, there are also some other drawbacks that are more technical and not only relating to safety. Um, ammonia calls for uh, some sort of special and expensive components. Uh, you normally need uh, stainless steel. Uh, everywhere, including ball valves that are quite expensive. Um, no copper is allowed, uh, while with CO2, you can also use K65 and brazing, which is easier than welding with, uh, with stainless steel. Um, when, doing a, um, when doing a cascade system, sorry, I get a message from the... Shaco team. There you go. Uh, when uh, when using um, ammonia, 
uh, you normally have a, a cascade system and uh, normally you are using CO2 in the bottom part of the cycle. Therefore, CO2 and uh, ammonia are connected through a condenser that is normally quite expensive. Uh, you normally work, when, when dealing with ammonia, you normally work with open drive compressors, and this is a weak point from a leakage standpoint. Um, ammonia works in vacuum at uh, starting at minus 33, uh, so uh, some purgers have to be used. Um, ammonia is working with non-miscible lubricant, so oil management is, uh, is critical and is a, something you have to take care very carefully about. Um, during heat recovery, in most of the cases, ammonia cannot flow directly in heat recovery coils. Uh, so for heat recovery, CO2 may be more efficient. Um, in case there are some uh, leakage, uh, you have to take care that uh, these leakage are not affecting controls. Otherwise, the plant may shut down. Um, and um, clearly, in order to decrease the amount of uh, leakage source, you have to try to uh, bring in uh, the smaller amount of joints possible. So this brings into uh, single compressor units that are normally less efficient during part load. Um, from a CO2 standpoint, uh, clearly CO2 is non-toxic in the classical sense, but clearly specific measures have to be in place in order to take care of the fact that uh, uh, CO2 interacts with our breathing. Uh, CO2 works with miscible lubricant, so oil return is definitely easier. Um, sorry about that. I was here. Um, normally, CO2 brings in slimmer racks, so definitely a foot, the footprint of the rack is, uh, is smaller. And this brings in cost saving when it comes to building expenses. Uh, commissioning of a CO2 equipment is normally quicker. Uh, you work with semi-hermetic compressors that are featuring less maintenance and uh, basically no leakages. Uh, vessels, when you do a flooded system, uh, vessels are almost half size when talking about CO2. Um, when you are using uh, adiabatic cooling or other means to decrease the head pressure in CO2 system. Uh, you will not need uh, water treatment chemicals where you norm that are normally needed with ammonia. Um, CO2 has a larger specific capacity. Uh, this brings in much smaller pipe diameters. And also, the, uh, in case of uh, uh, refrigerant charge, you normally have uh, a much more allowance in terms of kilogram per square meter um, due to the different uh, safety class of the refrigerant. Uh, for ammonia is 7.5 kilogram per square meter and uh, for CO2 is uh, 0 0.83. In case adiabatic cooling is needed, uh, you can also think about using less water with, uh, with CO2. Uh, this is basically due to the fact that uh, for CO2, you are working in transcritical operation. And uh, basically, this means that uh, the surface of uh, the gas cooler uh, have to be uh, wet in a lower ratio. Uh, when working with ammonia or other HFC refrigerant, uh, you can... Uh, uh, basically uh, do adiabatic cooling, but you need to wet the entire surface of the, of the condenser. While with CO2, uh, you can only apply water parts in principle and in theory, you can apply water parts only at the very last section of the gas cooler because you need to provide some subcooling and you do not have condensation throughout the entire flow pattern of the gas cooler itself. Um, actually, uh, adiabatic cooling works very well with, uh, with carbon dioxide. Uh, from this one slide, you can see field measurement of a adiabatic gas cooler uh, working in Beijing. Uh, this is an example from a supermarket, a large supermarket in Beijing, transcritical unit. 
for the first week of operation, the supermarket was not uh, working with the adiabatic pads engaged for technical reason. So you can see on the left side, the ambient temperature was 39.6 degrees C, so very warm day. 94 bar as the head pressure, uh, 42 degrees C as the gas cooler outlet, and the uh, high pressure valve opening uh, closing for 76-76%. The next week, the adiabatic gas cooler pads were put into operation, so you can still see um, very high ambient temperature, 38.8, but look at the head pressure. From 94 bar, we went down to 80.5 bar with a gas cooler outlet temperature of 30 degrees C and the closing of the high pressure valve of 55%. So in a very warm day in a dry environment, adiabatic cooling with CO2 works very well, works extremely well because it enables you to provide a significant COP boost. If we put these numbers into a selection software, you can see that the COP without adiabatic cooler engaged is of 1.23. Same compressor working in the operating condition registered over here will bring to a COP of 2.32. So definitely when possible and when it makes sense, adiabatic cooling brings in a lot of COP boost when talking about CO2 transcritical. Um, another big difference between uh, uh, CO2 and ammonia is uh, basically a very high volumetric capacity, very high specific refrigeration capacity, which is from four to 12 times higher than ammonia, depending on the operating conditions. And this brings a big advantage for contractors and then users because you will have much smaller pipings. Smaller pipings clearly means less cost, but also very easy construction work very easy maintenance. The diameters of the pipes are much smaller, so they cost less, but they are also much easier to displace. Um, another interesting feature is uh, pressure drops. Normally, uh, CO2 pressure drop, CO2 are, uh, in, is inducing smaller pressure, pressure drops. Uh, this means that a higher fluid speed is allowed with CO2, and this brings a very nice heat transfer coefficient. Well, okay, this is clearly a comparison between R22 and 134A, but maybe we can uh, assume that R22 has a similar heat transfer coefficient to ammonia. And you can see that CO2 is bringing in a very nice K factor, very good heat transfer coefficient. Uh, when it comes to heat recovery, CO2 is able to provide uh, so-called waterfalls heat recovery possibility. Basically with CO2, you can have high temperature water available up to 90 degrees C, medium temperature water available up to 60 degrees C, and also low temperature available like 20 degrees C, which can be used for floor heating of cold rooms or for the icing cold rooms and all other areas where human beings have to access extremely cold environment, closed environment where uh, the floor may be icing every now and then. Um, uh, when it comes to a comparison between CO2 and ammonia uh, from a total cost of ownership, uh, when it comes to capital expenditure, uh, normally, uh, the um, compressor rack and the condenser or gas cooler is typically cheaper. Installation costs are cheaper. Uh, from an operational expenditure, clearly energy consumption is a driver. Uh, definitely ammonia is a great refrigerant from a thermodynamic standpoint. So from a pure energy efficiency perspective, uh, ammonia uh, can be considered to a certain extent more efficient than CO2. However, with the latest 
development in terms of CO2 cycles, uh, I'm referring to parallel compression, ejector, adiabatic coolers, and the like, uh, CO2 can pretty much be aligned to ammonia also in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, clearly, maintenance costs are totally different also in terms of compressors. Uh, normally, compressors are designed in a way that they can run at, till their end of life without preventive maintenance. So they can run for 50, 60,000 hours without being inspected. Uh, and then they can be simply replaced. Uh, clearly, an exact calculation is very difficult to be made when we do a total cost of ownership comparison between CO2 and ammonia, but some kind of estimation is possible with some sort of assumptions. Uh, which are these assumptions? Basically, when we talk about the rack and the condenser, uh, for ammonia, in case of ammonia, um, the, the ammonia skids are normally installed on site. There is really no industrialization in building those skids. Uh, they need normally a cooling water or an adiabatic co an, a cooling tower or an adiabatic cooling, uh, which means water chemical treatment is needed. Uh, when you are using ammonia for low temperature operation, you will definitely need a purger. Uh, while uh, when we talk about CO2, uh, the architecture of a booster rack is basically the same of the ones are used being used in supermarket business. So there is a very strong industrialization available for racks, which brings down the cost. Uh, let's say that adiabatic cooling is beneficial, but is not necessary. So either you save money or you bring in some more efficiency. Uh, clearly, uh, from a capital expenditure, it is difficult to compare, but for a um, branch the system, so not for a chiller, but for a branch the system, uh, a lower cost between 30% to 50% is um, doable when talking about CO2 against ammonia. Uh, when we talk about pipings, still from a capital expenditure standpoint, uh, try to have a look here at the various diameters that are available and needed for various refrigerant. Uh, clearly, I just put 513A uh, here at minus 40, which is really not the application, but just to complete the calculation. But you can see how a DN100 pipe how much capacity a DN100 uh, DN pipe can bring with CO2 against the other refrigerant. So definitely this means that uh, CO2 brings in much smaller pipe diameters. This is an extreme cost savings for distributed systems, for branched system, and in particular for low temperature application. And again, also in terms of pipe branching, we can expect a 30% to 50% lower cost when uh, using CO2 instead of ammonia. Clearly, uh, if we talk about the chiller, uh, this uh, cost difference will be much smaller. Uh, when it comes to machinery room, uh, CO2 is also able to provide much more compact uh, environment where to work, where you can install your racks. On the left side, you see a ammonia machinery room. On the right side, you see a CO2 machinery room. Clearly, uh, CO2 brings in a much lower footage needed. Uh, for a 1.5 megawatt total duty, you can assume you will need about 100 square meters for a CO2 rack and a 350 square meter for an ammonia rack. Uh, this is another example for a uh, 2.7 megawatt system between ammonia and CO2. So definitely CO2 brings in uh, uh, two slimmer, smaller racks made with many compressors, okay, but still the footprint of the racks is pretty, is pretty much small. So this brings in a lot of savings in terms of uh, machinery room footage. 
and then from a, an efficiency standpoint, let's try to make a kind of comparison between uh, a large system featuring 2.5 megawatt empty duty, medium temperature, and 500 kilowatt low temperature duty. Uh, and uh, let's try to um, simulate the yearly operation of 10 different systems. Uh, using ammonia and CO2 in various declination. So basically we go from a two-stage ammonia, system A, then two-stage ammonia with cooling tower, uh, then we go for CO2 cascade system and ammonia on top with evaporative condenser, then with cooling tower, and then we, took, we take into consideration um, full CO2 system. Uh, from flash gas bypass to parallel compression to ejectors and then we can also add on top a evaporative gas cooler like adiabatic cooling. So we have 10 systems here from A to J being running in a lot of uh, uh, environment from a in a lot of jurisdictions, uh, assuming in Europe, here you can see the energy consumption of those various systems. We have here a three axis diagram. On the X axis, you have the period of the year from January to, uh, to, to December. On the Y axis, you have the various technologies. And on the Z axis, you have energy consumption. So basically you can see that every technology is featuring a peak during warmer season. But the absolute value of the peak is completely different when going from Copenhagen to Athens. This estimation has been done for various uh, climate profiles, Athens, Barcelona, Milano, Paris, Warsaw, and Copenhagen. So let's say from very warm to very cold. And these are the results. So let me go to this one slide showing the overall view of uh, what we have been investigating. So this one slide is kind of summarizing the uh, energy comparison between the various system. For each climate profile, for each city, the benchmark has been set forth being CO2 and ammonia cascade system with evaporative condenser. So you can see that the reference point set to one is always CO2 and ammonia with evaporative condenser. And you can see the other technologies, how they perform depending on the climate profile. So you can see, for instance, in Copenhagen, very cold climate, the best performing system is, again, CO2 plus ejector and evaporative condenser. If you apply a standard flash gas bypass system to compare with CO2 ammonia cascade, you can see that this system is about 7% less efficient. If you do the same comparison in Athens and take into consideration, again, the benchmark, CO2 cascade with ammonia with evaporative condenser against CO2 flash gas bypass, you can see that CO2 flash gas bypass in a year of operation is about 30% less efficient than the baseline. So clearly you will need to implement evaporative cooling with CO2, parallel compression and ejector, but using ejectors, evaporative condenser and parallel compression enables CO2, full CO2 transcritical technology to approach the baseline, which have been set as being ammonia and CO2 cascade. Clearly, adding on top parallel compression, evaporative condenser, ejectors, brings in a lot of cost. So the CO2 rack may not be um, 
so much convenient, as we said before, when compared to ammonia. Uh, so, maintenance cost is also very important to mention. Uh, let's say that uh, with uh, when you talk about the typical CO2 and ammonia system using industrial compressors, uh, service maintenance is needed on a predictive basis. Typically, uh, compressors need a full overhaul between 5,000 and 10,000 hours of operation. Reasonably, you can think about 5,000 5, euro to 10,000 euro per compressors, per maintenance. And in this case, 20 years compressor lifetime is definitely expectable. While with CO2 transcritical, this is a completely different approach because especially with compressors, like I said, there is no predictive maintenance needed. Clearly, oil and functional checks have to be done with regular intervals. Normally, compressors can be running until their end of life. So let's say 10 to 12 years, depending on the amount of hours of operation every day. And again, when it comes to maintenance cost, CO2 can bring in a significant cost saving that can be dated between 30% and 50% as reasonable figures. Clearly, it is very difficult to provide exact numbers. Uh, just to give you an idea where CO2 is successfully used in very large equipment, this is uh, one the largest Aldi warehouse in Europe, featuring four megawatt uh, duty between medium temperature and low temperature load for a total surface of 62,000 square meters, where we have temperature control on more than 29,000 square meters. And this warehouse features 22 meters indoor height. So it's really a monster equipment done with CO2 transcritical technology. Another interesting application I would like to mention for CO2 industrial application is this one over here. This is the Atlas in, uh, in uh, Atlas system in Switzerland, in CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, you can see the a man standing here so you can understand the size of the equipment. And uh, this unit is meant to provide 75 kilowatt at minus 53 evaporating temperature. And this is done with a CO2 booster system using three Dorin compressors. So another nice example where CO2 can be successfully applied in industrial refrigeration. Yeah, so I would like to end my presentation with a quote to Professor Lorentzen. Uh, I really agree in his, st in his statement, which is dated 1993, and he's saying CO2 is as close as to the ideal refrigerant as it is possible to come. Uh, actually, I would also like to mention that we have uh, a very nice software available for free on our website that can allow you to uh, simulate the operation of system using flash gas bypass, parallel compressors, ejector, HVAC integration, and heat recovery. Thank you very much for your attention. I am available for any questions. Giacomo, we had a question on LinkedIn from Stuart Webb. He says, what is the ammonia technology being compared? Pumped, LRP, LPR? It is not pumped. It is DX expansion with ammonia. So it's not flooded. Any other questions?
Hello? Not so sure if some other questions are made. I cannot hear you any longer. Very good. Thank you very much.